and welcome to Friday Night Huddle. I'm Dave Bacon. Week four of high school football in Ohio. That means a lot of the teams are entering conference play. Pleased to be joined by my huddle teammates, Dan Lobby from Cleveland.com, Nate Klein from Cleveland.com. Week four, guys, let's take a look at the menu. Here are the games that we are covering tonight uh, in depth, if you will. We'll have reporters all over Northeast Ohio. Menor and Strongsville going at it. Brexville and Hudson in a Suburban League battle. Another Suburban League battle, Revere and Wadsworth. Uh, Revere and Barberton, Wadsworth and Nordonia. Parma at bay. Uh, out in the Federal League, Maslin, Perry, Maslin, Jackson. That's an interesting one. Another Federal League battle, Copley and Bedford. Uh, Padua and Warrensville Heights. That's another kind of interesting matchup. Solon Illyria and uh, Euclid and Medina. So you see the games, uh, Dan Lobby, uh, what is it you're looking at? Which one of these uh, kind of grabs your attention? I like this Brexville hudson matchup, Division II, Region 5 matchup. Uh, two teams that really could use this win, 2-1. and one. Of course, Hudson is coming off of a, a really tough loss against Canton McKinley. But Colt Pillay, when he's played well, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, 14 of 20 through to six different receivers. He's a difference maker for them. And on the, then on the other side for Brexville, you had Luke Sternad there last year. You replace him with a freshman, Joe Labus, and, and he's picked things right up. 291 passing yards in his debut, three touchdowns le uh, against South. Um, th this is a guy that can deliver the football and, and keep that Brexville high-scoring offense going. Ninth grader. <laughs> Future is bright for the bees. Yeah. Uh, Nate Klein, which one grabs your attention here? Well, the game I'm going to be looking at is the Copley and Bedford game. Now, this is a game of uh, retribution for both of these teams. So, Copley is coming off a 21-20 loss last week uh, against Uniontown Lake. And Bedford, well, they've been clicking on all cinders to 3-0. and However, I'm sure that they actually remember that 37-20 loss in the regular season finale uh, against uh, Copley. So, I'm going to be watching this game. It's also going to be uh, a, a game of... Uh, who can commit the least amount of turnovers. We'll talk about that later on as well. Uh, but definitely, this is a Region uh, 5 matchup uh, that whoever wins this game is going to take advantage of the, uh, over the other. Yeah, and uh, one that I am kind of interested in is the, um, the Euclid mm -hmm. game against Medina. Euclid, team that's been really good in the first half. 2-1 and one, was leading St. Ignatius 14-10 at halftime after they threw a pick six on the first play of the game and um, then just kind of fell apart in the second half. And that's kind of been the story. Uh, Coach Rotsky's trying to figure out how to get the second half rolling, kind of like he has the first half. If it was an easy answer, he'd have it done, obviously, but uh, Euclid working on that um, as well. So that's uh, kind of an interesting game as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and Dave, I was with you in that press box uh, when I wasn't down in the first half, but uh, that game, I was, uh, you know, it, it was it was, a, it was a pleasant surprise to see Euclid come out in that first half. The defense, you know, that was something that uh, Coach Kyle was talking about, say, look, this is a very aggressive defense, um, and you, we need to be able to find a way to be able to balance our offense. Uh, but, you know, you know, credit to Euclid, great first half, but, you know, the an next answer is how are they going to finish off in the next two quarters after that? And, and if you look at Region 1, you know, according to Joe Attell, I, I mean, that, that's a tough region. you got a bunch of 3 and O's, a bunch of 2 and ones That's where Euclid is sitting. Um, so you don't want to you don't want to fall too far behind get that second loss too early so this is an enormous opportunity for them yeah and you know there's uh, you know again there are worse things than being a team that starts really fast <laughs> and then because you can get away with that against some teams mm -hmm. you know um, they they got out to a big start they were leading Glenville 32 to 6 after the first quarter and then Glenville came back uh, same thing beat Aurora, a very good Aurora team, and, and Aurora made it a game. So there are worse things than, than you know, having to figure out how you put two halves together, especially when you've been so good in the first half of games. And, and they've played such good teams. You touched on it. Glenville, St. Ignatius, Aurora. I, I mean, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say Aurora's probably the best 0-3 team in the state. Um, so th that's a good, tough schedule. Now maybe as you kind of – maybe it lightens up for you in spots, and like you said, you can afford those slow starts um, if, if it comes to that. And there we see uh, Medina. That's their defense. Euclid uh, with the football as they've uh, been very productive. And, again, they're on the Medina half of the field. Their quarterback is C.J. Hale. He's a senior. That's their speed back, uh, Ronald Lee. And you see uh, Lee – 
kind of getting forward into the 30-yard line. So a good pickup by Ronald Lee. Uh, their big play wide receiver from a week ago was uh, Drayvon Lindsey, who really stepped up. Let's, uh, let's take a listen in, as you can see this game later on Spectrum Sports. And as the flag flies, it's going to be an automatic first down. The referees initially signal an encroachment foul on Medina. Get a look there at our head referee tonight. How about we give you all the referees? We don't want to single any one of them out individually. Our head official is Pat Perry, as this play is blown dead with a couple of flags flying. Dennis Falcione, the umpire. Terry Swagger, the linesman. Line judge is Andy Boatleaguer. And Pete Malika, the back judge. I was just going to comment that with getting uh, Medina to jump off sides, a lot of times when you run that high tempo, that NASCAR offense, you're not allowing the defense to get set, and they'll be a little jumpy if you give them a hard count. <laughs> Euclid wants to go so quickly, they're still signaling the uh, flag, which they haven't picked up off the field yet. <laughs> so the Panthers are uh, pedal to the metal here in the uh, opening drive of the game. Hard to blame them. That's their uh, probably where they're at their best. It is, and you know, they call the plays very quickly from the sideline. You see Coach Rotsky uh, to the left of your screen. He'll actually yell of the plays often to uh, the quarterback, C.J. Hale. There you see him, just to the left there, right on the 35-yard line. That's Coach Rotsky in the shorts. Uh, well, if you can't see him, you can certainly hear him. <laughs> There's a handoff to Lee, and he is whacked. Actually, I beg your pardon, that's Reggie Wilkerson. Handoff was to number Yeah, they've got a number of backs. You're going to see Reggie Wilkerson, Brandon Wright, and Ronald Lee. He stopped at the line of scrimmage by number And a nice tackle. That's Radabaugh again from that outside linebacker position coming up to make the hit. It's a good play by Medina, even though... The Bees gave up five yards. They got them right back defensively after the false start. So now it actually works out in their favor after that no gain. It's second down and 15 from the pistol into the shotgun. Rand on the misdirection handoff has an opening through the middle, and he's finally dragged down from behind, tackled by Andrew Horton. Finally brought down by number 12, Adam Smith. Watch, they're going to run Arquan Bush in motion. There's... Uh, the fake on the jet, and they give it to Ron Lee right up the middle. Look at the power. Delivering blows, finishing the run. Demetrius Shannon on the receiving end as Euclid presses inside the red zone. Probably heard it on the PA. That was Adam Smith. I don't want to misidentify the tackler. Adam Smith did a nice job dragging him down from behind. So Euclid is knocking on the door here in their first drive of the game. But unfortunately, they can't get out of their own way. And for the second time in this drive, the offense has started too quickly, leaving Jeff Roski a little bit frustrated. And this is uncharacteristic of the, the 2017 version of the Euclid Panthers. Very clean game last week again against Ignatius. That was one of the takeaways is uh, how well disciplined they are. You know they're well coached. Third down and eight as Rand goes to the left-hand side. Delivers a nice block. Hale throws a decent ball, but that was pretty well covered on the far side of the field, and Medina has forced Euclid into a fourth down shy of the sticks after Bush came up with a catch. Yeah, they've got Arquan Bush in the slant, um, I'm sorry, in the slot to the top, and they have Drayvon Lindsay, who you know is going to attract attention. You know, I had a chance to talk to both Coach Larry Laird, we, we did rather, as well as Mike Rodak, the defensive coordinator, and this is something they worked on all week identifying where the playmakers, especially Lindsay, are, and making sure they don't let him inside on the slant. That time it was Lindsay up the sideline and an out route from Arquan Bush. Well, Euclid wants to go for the jugular here early. They're out to make a statement on the first drive of the game. It's fourth and four, and that's a first down. Maybe a touchdown. It's awfully close as Javon Owens brings it down just shy of the goal line. He's down to the one. Five-yard hitch, Brendan. Easy pitch and catch, and there's making the defender miss. A little over-aggressive. Uh, by Jameson Van Dry. And it took four Bs to bring him down. Nobody's bringing down Ron Lee. He's in. Lee touchdown, in Panthers. Panthers touchdown. Ronald Lee gets behind big Ryan Johnson, who you had pointed out uh, as we were going through the starters. That's the right guard, and Jalen Jackson, the right tackle. 
And it's Ronald Lee. So there you see, Ronald Lee caps it off, and Euclid continues to play very well early in the game. A good drive by the Panthers. Let's look in on St. Ignatius, courtesy of the SIBN St. Ignatius Broadcast Network. There's Mark Babinski, and he's inside the five-yard line. So you see uh, St. Ignatius playing Detroit Catholic Central. It's a team from the Michigan area, the state of Michigan, that beat them a year ago uh, on a controversial play in overtime, but they did hand St. Ignatius one of their losses. Their legendary coach uh, retired after the year. One of his assistants took over. Second down and four for the Panther or for the Wildcats. There's Babinski. He gets the outside. Babinski keeps going and brought down at the two. I want to remind you, this is the uh, SIBN, St. Ignatius Broadcast Network. So all students involved in this, uh, Jake Soraka and Dave DeSalvo uh, running the camera for the uh, St. Ignatius Wildcats. Both of those young men are seniors. So I uh, want to thank uh, their moderator, Jeff McCormick, for allowing us this look in uh, as St. Ignatius trying to take the early lead on Detroit Catholic Central. And there's Babinski again, spins and some good pursuit by uh, the Shamrocks from Detroit Catholic Central as they bring him down. Loss of a yard, so it'll be fourth down and goal from the three, and they're gonna bring out the field goal unit, Matthew Trickett, really good kicker, and a pretty short one there. As he's lining up the 10-yard line, it'll be a 20-yard field goal early on as St. Ignatius trying to convert and uh, give them a, uh, an early lead here, as you see time remaining in the first quarter. So the Wildcats trying to get the lead, snap and set her good, trick it. Knocks it through, so St. Ignatius uh, scores on their first possession to take an early 3-0 lead. So guys, um, two teams that played last week mm -hmm. doing pretty good and taking the early lead. Yeah, and for Euclid, getting on the board early, that's great. Uh, how about this for Medina? Outscored 79-7 to the last two weeks. So uh, you, you can put up some points against this Medina team, especially the way they've played the last couple weeks. And how about Detroit Central Catholic? That's Mark Babinski territory right there, inside yeah. the five-yard line. Uh, and they were stout and held them to a field goal attempt. And what's disappointing, and, and I'm wondering how they're going to respond after that, one of my keys going into that game was, can St. Ignatius control this game? Obviously, last week when Euclid got out, you know, Euclid jumped out to that 14-point lead, uh, you know, they lost control in that first half, and so they needed to pick that up. So I was curious to see how they were going to respond come week four. But it's, it was kind of a little disappointing to see that they couldn't uh, get Mark Babinski in that end zone for a touchdown, and they had to settle for a field goal. Uh, but Mark Babinski, uh, he had over 150 yards last week, uh, two touchdowns, so he, he knows how to find a way in there at some point. So we'll see what happens yeah, the rest of the night. And keep in mind, Detroit Catholic Central is a really good football team. They're 2-1 and one on the year. They've already played, uh, you know, three games, lost to Toledo Whitmer, beat a couple of Catholic schools in, uh, in their region. In, um, the, the Detroit area, obviously. Um, it's a good start. You know, you, you get points on the board, you score first, and, you know, that St. Ignatius defense is pretty good. And they're going to face a, uh, a wing tee. So they run, they run not only a wing tee, they run a full house backfield. Basically, Detroit Central Catholic formation, but they run the football is their bread and butter, and, and then they try to sneak a pass into the tight end or to a back, and, and uh, that's how they handle it. Um, if we switch gears... Medina's beat up. Uh, you know, they're missing a couple of their very good defensive players. So, um, obviously, Jeff Rotsky's going to try to get that, you know, out of control as early as he can for the Panthers. Yeah. yeah. There is no sympathy <laughs> in week four of high school football. No, well, especially when you're in that region yeah. one and, and you just can't. I mean, if you're two and two, all of a sudden, you know, you're struggling to play catch up. And uh, for Medina, it's just. It's just been rough for them. You know, they beat Lakewood in the opener last two weeks. They, they played a couple of teams that are undefeated right now. Like I said, 79-7 uh, to 7 in those games, and it doesn't get easier. They've got Shaker. They've got Menor. They've got Strongsville. Brunswick. Solon still on the schedule. So um, and Medina's got to try and get right and get right quickly. Uh, we mentioned uh, one of the games we're keeping an eye on from the Suburban League. Bedford 3-0 and taking on 2-1 and Copley, and it's the Indians who uh, get things going offensively early on. Uh, they move it down into break Blake trailer territory, and he bites his way into the end zone. So Indians, uh, an early 7-0 lead as they cop, cap off, Copley caps off a, uh, an early scoring drive as well. 
20 carries, uh, 90 uh, rushing yards, and two touchdowns last week for uh, uh, the running back, who also has a, a brother as well on the team as well. Uh, but that's a great sign here for Copley. Uh, obviously, they're, you know, they got a win against Bedford last year. But you know, Bedford, obviously, you know, you got to wonder, you know, man, I know that they're going to probably come out and try to win this game because they they didn't forget last year and how that went. Uh, but you know, this game, from what I'm being told, it may be decided by maybe a touchdown or so. So keep an eye on this game. This may be a really close game here. Well, keep in mind. Bedford has some playmakers too, so you know when they get the football, you know, they're a little little tough to handle. So uh, that'll be interesting. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, Maslin Perry, Maslin Jackson, uh, Federal League battle. Um, you know Jackson had an impressive uh, Week One win over Akron East. That's a team uh, very good. You know has has a number of guys back. Perry really hadn't been tested so this this is going to be they're going to get tested in the federal league but this is the first of many tests in that Perry Maslin Perry Maslin Jackson game yeah and I mean they've done their job to this point you know 49 14 21 7 49 7 so they're, they're beating teams they should beat and beating them by a lot but now this is the week when you look at them and say all right, all right Perry show me what you got do, do you belong in this discussion in the federal league with everyone else or did you just beat up on some bad teams early and my concern about last week, I mean, even though that um, uh, Perry was able to get the win against uh, Valley Forge, Valley Forge finished last year with a 1-9 record. So we're kind of tabling like, well, what kind of Valley Forge did you see in week three? But obviously, one, they got the win, but now they've got to figure out how they're going to deal with the UMass recruit, uh, Jarrett Pelota. Um, he's a handful, uh, had a great game uh, last week, and uh, I'm curious to see how Perry's going to be able to contain that uh, offense as well. Well, the, the other thing that happens when you get into the Federal League, teams are used to what Perry does. You know, Perry runs the wing tee. You know, their, their version of mixing it up is, okay, we're going to switch the, the guard that pulls, basically, for the wing tee. And, you know, the, the first three games, if you're not used to that, that's, that's a lot. You can't simulate the speed of that. When you get into the Jacksons and the Greens and the rest of the Federal League, they've seen this. They know what's coming. So... If Perry can can do that in the Federal League, okay, that's that's a good thing. Yeah, and uh, Jarrett Pelota, we were actually talking about him. He's almost close to 1,000 yards after three games already. Uh, so, obviously, you know that they're going to air it out at some point. But also, just looking ahead, Joel Childress, uh, you know, he has almost 300 yards. So, uh, they have they have different ways they can attack you. And so, Perry's going to have to figure out a way. How are they going to slow down Jarrett and how are they going to slow down that offense? Uh, but now also looking at Jack, but also now looking at Perry, they've got a pair of running backs as well that are, uh, did fairly well after last week as well against Valley Forge. But again, we were kind of trying to figure out what kind of Valley Forge did they see in this. And so um, I'm a little bit curious to see how this game is going to end up here. Well, you're curious, so let's head out to the Maslin Perry, Maslin Jackson game. And the Polar Bears growling early. Jared Pilata rolls out and finds his man 12 yards on the touchdown pass. And Jackson takes the early 7-0 lead uh, on the Pilata touchdown pass. So uh, Perry doesn't like to play from behind. You run that wing tee. One possession behind isn't bad. You start falling multiple possessions behind, and it becomes more and more of an issue. And Jared Pilata, you mentioned a UMass recruit. He's one of the top quarterbacks in the state getting it done early. Yeah, it just puts more pressure on, on Perry. Like you said, one possession is doable. You fall behind by two possessions. Now you're in some trouble. You start giving the ball away. So, so you're trying to hold on to the football a little bit here, run your offense, get on the board somehow, and, and just stay within striking distance. And Perry's not going to – they're oh, not going to no. panic. I they're mean, Keith flinch. Wakefield has been coaching and doing this forever, so <laughs> they'll get back at it. Uh, let's – Check in on the phone for the first time. Bryant Kaiser joins us. Bryant is at the Nordonia Wadsworth game. Bryant, what's going on with the Grizzlies and the Knights? With uh, five minutes to go in the first quarter, it's Wadsworth 14, Nordonia 0. We had a touchdown pass from Joey Botman to Christian Sl Slay. That was like 14 yards. And a one yard touchdown run by my man, Snowball. I got a lot of day. <laughs> you know, it's uh, Brock Snowball. His older brother, Jake, was great uh, when Wadsworth was back in the playoffs. Hey, how has the Grizzlies' defense done? Uh, Grizzlies' uh, defense is good. Uh, they had uh, they had an interception in one of Nordonio's trying to drive, and that they built off of that that touchdown run by Snowball to cap it off the drive. And right now, Nordonio's looking really good. Nordonio, I mean, Wadsworth, the Grizzlies. 
Nodonia is still trying to run this spread offense, which is really ain't gaining anything. And they're down 14 or nothing. And now they're really going to have to pass. How, uh, how has Boffman been running the football? That's, uh, that's a guy that's kind of one of those dual threat quarterbacks. Joey Boffman, the quarterback for the oh, Grizzlies. Yeah. Yeah, he had a 17-yard run to set up that one-yard touchdown run by Snowball. And, you know, Bob, he's, he's going to Virginia on a wrestling scholarship. So, you know, it's going to tough to bring him down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brian Kaiser, we appreciate the update on Wadsworth and Nordonia. We'll check back in with Brian as the night goes on. Yeah, Joey Bachman uh, has been in the state finals in wrestling a couple of years, finished fifth in the Ironman a year ago. He is headed to the University of Virginia to wrestle. Uh, pretty good quarterback, too. Absolutely, and I was uh, looking about some information about him after last week's win, but let me just read these numbers here to you. Uh, 274 yards passing three touchdowns, and then on the ground, 118 yards and two touchdowns. Yes, he, he is a dual quarterback there. Uh, so obviously a lot of offense runs through him. So if he's, if he's doing well in this game, obviously the Wadsworth Grizzlies offense is going to do well. Well, the other thing is he's a senior. He started since his sophomore year. He was in the state finals in wrestling as a sophomore as well. So it's a guy who kind of relishes the big stage. Yeah, and you know, on the other side, of Nordonia. Um, it's just a, <laughs> I think they had higher expectations for this season, and it just hasn't gone their way. Uh, they were outscored 35-7 in the second half last week, and now 14 nothing in this game. So uh, they're they're searching for answers and not finding them. And, and, and they've got to find a way to be able to stop Boffman, and that's kind of you know really kind of going to be the mystery here in this game. Can they do that? Uh, but now, also something that we were all hinting earlier about the Wadsworth defense. Um, this is also going to be a test for them because they're facing two. They're facing some teams that uh, were above the 500 mark in 2016. So it's kind of a good indicator to see where they are right now. Uh, but here's, the, here's the, also the uh, good point that Coach, I'm sure, likes. The average is about seven points they're allowing on um, the first three games. So um, heck of a job by the Grizzlies. But we're going to see what happens in this game here. But. And Coach Todd, you know, had a chance to talk to him last year, just kind of building that program. And, and they're taking a pretty big step forward. They come in 3-0, and already up 14 nothing. He felt like his, his guys were kind of starting to get it rolling uh, middle part of last year, and obviously he was right. You know, they're, they're the real deal. So they, they've got some challenges ahead in that suburban league, but um, – Definitely heading in the right direction, Wadsworth Grizzlies. Yeah, I mean that was credit to Wadsworth as well. You know, you get a first year, you get a first year coach coming in and saying, "Look, hey, here's my system. This is what we're doing." You know, you know, you kind of wondered like, how were they going to be able to respond to that? But they did great uh, after first year, and yeah. now it looks like that's certain materializing all that work in the off season. And he was thrilled. You know, he he felt like those kids had bought in, and, and that's always um, the big thing. Another game we're looking at. Padua taking on Warrensville Heights. Padua Bruins, one of those teams that's flying a little bit under the radar, you know. And, um, you know, they just missed the playoffs a year ago, and, and you know, they're, they're rolling again. And Trenton Kramer, he's flying under the radar. The numbers he's put up, you know, 283 and three scores in his first game, 219 and three scores in his second game. I mean, he's been carrying the load for that team. And, you know, we know about the quarterback they have, Kevin Pedersen, big guy, the type of quarterback you like if, if you're running a, a kind of pro-style sort of offense where he's in the pocket a lot. Um, so they, yeah, that's a dangerous football team that, that, like you said, nobody's really talking about. Yeah, be in a, unless they're on your schedule, then you're aware of them. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll find out about them real fast. <laughs> the Bruins uh, defense will also have a test tonight. I was trying to stop Dante Norris uh, from uh, – Warrensville Heights, 96 yards and two TDs last night. So the defense is going to get an opportunity to say, look, hey, can we stop this kid from uh, running the football against us? The offense is going to take care of itself. We've got a chance to see how well they're doing. Uh, but I think it's going to be coming down to that. If they can stop him tonight, they should be fine. Uh, another game that we touched on a little bit and, and uh, we'll, we'll look at, you know, the Barberton and Revere game. Barberton, team I like a whole lot, made it to the playoffs a year ago. Revere's playing pretty well, so this is this is a really big test for the Minutemen as they look at Barberton coming up. Yeah, and Revere's got a senior quarterback. Uh, they, they've got a running back and, and Matt Busser that they can count on. Had 129 yards and a couple scores against North. Um, you know, that's a team sitting at two and one 
wanting to make a statement against Barberton, who's off to the kind of start that they wanted and the kind of start that they expected. Um, so a good test here for Revere. Um, exactly with Revere, uh, but I think Barberton, where I kind of see them favoring, is they're putting up a lot of points in these first three weeks. So can Revere be able to stop that offense uh, led by Zane Reese Zane himself? Reese. So uh, we're going to see what happens with the uh, Revere defense. Uh, but again, obviously coming in, both of these teams haven't given up a lot of points, but just I kind of give the advantage right now to Barberton, who's just putting up a lot of points in the first three weeks. Well, let's check back in. Uh, St. Ignatius, a 3 nothing lead in the uh, first quarter. They took the the drive that they, they had the ball and moved down the field, scored on a one-yard run. Here, a little counter, Take and it's Bo Floyd, Floyd, the junior speed back, breaks a tackle, hops into the end zone. And uh, before the first quarter is over, St. Ignatius, a 10-0 lead. So there you go, Nate. You, you were concerned about the field goal. They put it in the end zone the next time they had the football. 10-0 St. Ignatius with the early lead on Detroit Catholic Central. And see, but see, you also know what St. Ignatius is capable of. So, you know, I don't want to say, you know, I, I was fearing the worst, <laughs> but it's just, I mean, you yep. know what, what quarterback Kyle Hall is capable of throwing for over 160 yards last week against Euclid. So you know that this offense is not going to be short. But again, going back to the one of the keys I said, if St. Ignatius can control this game, especially after the overtime loss last year to the team, yep. uh, they should be doing well. So. And I had independent people say there were some fans Phantom flags that came out that led it, and they weren't associated with with Saint Ignatius either. I, I got a couple emails about that. You know, we we saw Bo Floyd. He's a junior, and he's a really nice. Con that's a that's a little bit of a shifty speed back. He's not as big as Mark Babinski, um, and I don't want to say he's faster, but he's that sh guy that has the other gear that maybe Babinski doesn't. Babinski's going to kind of run you over. He's going to kind of move by you and find the seam, and you, you saw that right there. It's, it's a really nice combination, especially behind that big offensive line. N not against necessarily Euclid, but when they use Floyd and Babinski on week two, you know, they, they – put together a really great combination in their own offense. Uh, but yeah, Floyd's gonna have to get involved in this. And I say he's probably one of those secrets uh, coming into the year, like, you know, hey, you know, now that Babinski, we can let him take a break and step Floyd in. You know, that's gonna be something that the state's gonna have to wonder, especially as we get further ahead and potentially if St. Nation makes the playoffs too. Yeah, they're, they're looking pretty good. You know? <laughs> I think they're gonna give it. I think they're gonna make it. I'm gonna go out on a limb, and I'm gonna say that they're probably that gonna make team's it. pretty good. Oh, uh, we had mentioned the uh, the Barberton and Revere game, and the Magic offense has been magic again. Uh, seven nothing lead, and uh, Barberton's offense trying to get more, and it's Barker, Jeff Barker, fighting through. Good run by Barker. He finds the end zone uh, from six yards out. Fourteen nothing as uh, the Magic putting points on the board in a hurry again. If, if you notice that over the last few weeks, we've, talk, we've heard about different names coming from Barberton being able to score the football. So, uh, man, this, this is really good for Barberton's offense and probably a little bit fearful for uh, the rest of the conference that they're going to be playing in. So they've got to figure out who they're going to stop. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, there's Turnbaugh, the, the wide receiver. We know Key Thompson, a running back. Barker has been a guy that's run it and caught it out of the backfield from Zane Reese. So you put a lot of those guys out and say, okay, <laughs> how, how do you want to defend it? And, yet, and you start digging into that defense's depth chart all of a sudden. You know, however you want to use those guys, whether you spread them out, uh, whether you put them in the backfield, whatever you want to do, you start digging into that depth chart of a defense, and it starts to expose some of these teams that maybe aren't as deep as they need to be defensively. And, and talking about defense, you know, uh, Revere, they're going to need this win tonight because they play in the Region, region 9, uh, who's some familiar names that we've already talked about. Uh, but they need a win tonight because they need to be able to keep pace with some of those teams in that region. Uh, but Barberton right now looks like they're still continuing what they've been doing the last three games and just running that offense. Zane Reese with over 260 yards last week. So, heck of a job by the senior. One of the games we mentioned earlier, Brexville taking on Hudson. The Explorers trying to rebound uh, from a tough loss against Canton McKinley. They're at home. This is a Suburban League matchup in the Explorers offense. Uh, looking pretty good as a uh, little zone read. Kevin Callahan, look at him. Little oh, stiff, stiff arm, arm gets into the end zone. He's not the biggest guy. He's pretty quick. 7 nothing. Hudson takes the early lead on Brexville. Uh, I'll just go ahead and lead off. Uh, hashtag FNH Top Plays. Uh, if you want to submit your play, uh, just get on Twitter and use that hashtag. That's, again, that's hashtag FNH Top Plays. But, yeah, great job uh, the running back right there. But um, that was one of my keys coming into the game. And, obviously, they play Camp McKinley. They lost that game. And, obviously, just the defense that the Bulldogs present, you can't do too much. Uh, but one of my keys I was looking at that game was that uh, – 
Hudson actually needs to make sure that they get out early and start scoring fast. And so, obviously, it looks like they're working on that already. Look a little bit like uh, Thomas Wilkes, a guy I'm sure we'll talk about from Solon. Um, he's a small guy, but powerful, and that stiff arm. You didn't ex like first of all, you didn't expect to see him coming from behind the line, and then you definitely didn't expect to see that stiff arm to get into the end zone. Well, he's kind of hard to see. You yeah, know? he's one of those well, I guys. I didn't see him until no, he came I, through. I mean, he's listed at five two, <laughs> so he he's not the biggest guy, but he's pretty quick. Yeah, and. Uh, so good for Kevin Callahan, gets in 21-yard touchdown run, 7-0 uh, Hudson with the early lead. Uh, that's a game they need. You know, mm -hmm. you, it's one thing to, to go and lose to Canton McKinley on the road. It's another, you know, Brexville on your home field. Uh, they need a rebound without question. Yeah, and, uh, you know, this is a, a program that knows how to win, and, and they're still in a good position in Region 5, but... Um, you know, Brexville is a nice test for them. And, and then, honestly, on the other side, this is a good test for Brexville. What kind of team are they? You know, we know about their defensive issues a year ago. Have they, have they cleaned those up a little bit? Hudson, though, has an opportunity, if they win this game, to maybe put together a little bit of a run before they have to face Stowe in mid-October. And Brexville's offense, I mean, you know, just historically, I mean, we know that that program does very well. 359 passing yards from uh, Joe Labus. Uh, we were talking about him. Wow, you know, so this offense knows how to get down the field if it needs to. But, again, this is a uh, conference game as well. They're both in the same region. And so, obviously, a win would go pretty far to help them in the playoffs. We are just about a half hour into week four of high school football. We're going to step aside and take a quick break. We're going to check in with one of our student reporters as we head to break. Matt Ganser takes us to the Bay student section. Take it away, Matt. Get it. Thanks, guys. I'm here with tonight's leaders of the student section. This is it, your big break, your one shot, your only chance. There are two outcomes, make history or be history. The home of high school sports, Spectrum Sports, exclusively on Spectrum. This city, this club, stands with you. Danger from Mira! What you live for lives here. The Volley Kamara, yes! Iowa's television home of Columbus Crew SC. Spectrum Sports, exclusively on Spectrum. Here. 
We are Spectrum Sports, exclusively on Spectrum. Wednesday nights, get ready for kickoff with Spectrum Sports. High School Blitz Preview, the can't-miss show for all things high school football. We'll break down team news, the latest standings, and what to expect on the road to Canton. High School Blitz Preview, Wednesday nights at 7 on Spectrum Sports, exclusively on Spectrum. Every week, from the locker room to the pitch and everywhere in between, Access Crew SC is your ultimate inside look at the black and gold. Join Marissa Contepelli, Dwight Burgess, and Neil Sika for unmatched coverage, in-depth analysis, and exclusive talks with the players and coaches. This is your club. This is your Access. Access Crew SC, Wednesdays on Spectrum Sports. The Ohio Lottery's Partners in Education program has been recognizing students and teachers who shine both in and out of the classroom since 2007. To nominate a deserving teacher or student, go to ohiolottery.com and click on Supporting Education. Students in kindergarten through 12th grade are eligible to be academic all-stars. K through 12 teachers can be honored as the Teacher of the Month. Every school that participates is eligible to be honored as the School of the Year. The Ohio Lottery's Partners in Education, where stars shine. Have you ever lived for something? Have you ever dreamt of something? Something more? Something special? Something bigger than yourself? Well, have you? This is what you live for! Of high school sports, Spectrum Sports, exclusively on Spectrum. Crew SC Match Day. Every match, 30 minutes before the kick. Delivering everything fans need to know. With live reports, unmatched analysis, club news, and more. After the game, stay here for Crew SC Post Match. From the biggest moments to the road ahead, Crew SC Match Day and Crew SC Post Match. Only on Spectrum Sports. Welcome back to Friday Night Huddle, week four across the Buckeye State for high school football. One of the games we're keeping our eye on, the Euclid Panthers taking on the Medina Bees. Euclid, a 6-0 lead after they punched in the one-yard touchdown oh, run, and here's Ronald Lee down. again, a nice cut, and look Nothing at the speed. 24 yards, yards on that Ron touchdown Lee. run. This touchdown time they Panthers converted the, the point Stepper. after. So a 13 uh, nothing lead early in the we second just, quarter the uh, for the, the Euclid quarter. Panthers. 13 nothing, uh, and that's actually in the second quarter now uh, as Euclid has the lead on Medina. So, uh, you know, they, they've got some weapons, and, you, you know, you, you play outside to try to take away the speed, and Ronald Lee and some of the big guys that block in front of them are going to hurt you. And uh, Jeff Rotsky's got a nice role going on offense. It's a great sign to see uh, Lee actually getting up two, two scores already because last week he only had 108 yards but no scores, which was unbelievable. So I'm just glad to see that, uh, you know, well, I'm sure the coaching staff is glad to see uh, that, you know, Ron was able to get in for a couple touchdowns and get a uh, score early. But, uh, yeah, Euclid's got to uh, start out early and try to uh, maybe even finish this out in the second half we've been talking about. Yeah, you know, the, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, against Ignatius, it's a little different because they, they run – you know, a 3-3 stack. So it's basically the the defense that St. Xavier has made popular under Steve Spack. A little different to try to run against that when you're not used to it. And what they'll do is two of those safeties in the five in the back, they're basically linebackers that can run. So they put them up at the line of scrimmage. It's tough to run against St. Ignatius. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and Coach Kyle, I mean, I talked to him after the game, but he was talking about that halftime. He said, you know, we can't have a first half the way we did. So they went back. 
talked about a few things and made some corrections. And obviously, you know, they tried to change a few things on defense, try to uh, fool Euclid in there. But Euclid didn't help themselves either because it's just they just failed to score. And I think they only scored a touchdown probably in those final uh, minute or two of the game. And the other thing Ignatius can do because they have a guy like Cameron Toppin. Yep. You know, they, they can put him on an island, you yep. know, and, and he can go make plays for them, and that frees up maybe another defender. Right, it makes the passing game more difficult just in general. So well, the, the other thing to keep in mind about St. Ignatius, they don't have Connor Kennedy yet. That's <laughs> that's their top wide receiver. He also plays DB from a, from a year ago. I think he's played one play, and uh, Coach Kyle was like, yeah, we got to get we got to get 12 back in playing. And so, you know, they're close to getting him back. So that'll just make a, a, a big difference both – in the secondary and the wide receiving core. Another game that we've been talking about, Padua and Wadsworth. We're going to check in with our Bill Mayville, who uh, is at that game. Bill, what's going on with the uh, the Bruins and the Tigers? Uh, actually, we were, we just uh, just came back from the end of the first quarter break, and Padua just punched in another touchdown. It's now uh, 24-6 to six the start of the second quarter, we're just uh, pending the extra point. Uh, so far for Padua, it's been a, a lot of a uh, big steady diet of Trent Kramer, and he's been carrying the load to them uh, pretty much down the whole field. Uh, so running the football, is has that been pretty much the, the, the Bruins' M.O.? I know quarterback's a, a very good passer, so the, what you're saying is the Bruins kind of diversifying here as well. Yeah, the, the, the Bruins have really almost exclusively run the ball in this, uh, this first quarter. Uh, Kramer's got unofficially, according to my numbers, 13 carries for 85 yards, and I, I believe he had that last touchdown, so uh, three touchdowns in the first half. Uh, they've only thrown the ball twice, so it's really been the running game so far. Defense turning it over, how are they, or, or are they just forcing threes and three and outs being Padua? Uh, forcing three and outs, the uh, the first Warrensville possession, they uh, they actually had a little self-inflicted wound and uh, snapped the, the punt. Uh, snap out of the end zone for safety. Uh, Warrensville's only only offense so far was a 95-yard kick return by Tavon and uh, Irvin. So uh, Warrensville, Warrensville's really struggling to find some momentum. Hey, Bill, you've, I know you've only seen a quarter, but, you know, I kind of touched on it. This Padua team seems to be flying a little bit under the radar as far as things go. It, it sounds like they look pretty impressive. Yeah, so far, I mean, the, the offensive line is really getting, uh, really getting a big surge off the ball. Uh, you know, Kramer's getting three, four yards downfield before somebody gets a hand on him on post plays. Um, it, really, the only time that they did score, the only time Padua did score in the first quarter, was uh, they had a drive, went down deep into the uh, deep into the Warrensville high end, and uh, they got backed up on a couple penalties and took them out of uh, scoring range. So, All right, Bill Mayville, we appreciate the update. We will check back in with Bill. Time to uh, check in on the... Bedford Copley game. Uh, Copley had the quick touchdown by Trailer, the touchdown run. Uh, mentioned Bedford has some playmakers, and uh, Jenkins finds his man. Oh, look at that. Breaks one tackle, still don't. Oh, another tackle, and you don't want to let him in the open field. Touchdown for the Bedford Bearcats. 8 7 is the score as uh, they convert the two point conversion. Bedford taking an 8 7 lead on Copley. That quick strike ability. Um, you know, it just means you're never, you're never going to be out of the game. You can always respond quickly. And man, that, that kid in the open field is fun to watch. Uh, Emmanuel Jenkins, uh, 222 yards passing last week uh, for the Bedford Bearcats. Uh, this offense is rolling and, uh, you know, it's carrying over into week four. Uh, but now this is where Copley's going to have to figure out, well, what are we going to do to answer that off that quick strike offense that they have? Uh, but, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, but, again, this, there's a lot at stake for this game. Obviously, they both play a game we were talking about in the same region. And uh, Bedford, you know, we're going to see what happens. But, uh, you know, obviously if the game gets tight, you know, I think they have a good chance of, uh, you know, using a short amount of time to score. Yeah, uh, Bedford, a team you, you definitely you, know, you don't want to sleep on. Uh, oh. And you better tackle in the open field. And it's very similar to what Euclid can do. You know, a little swing pass and you miss a tackle. And all of a sudden, the guy in the stripes is going like this because he just took it to the house. And that's, um, that's one of the things you have to worry about, you know, with, uh, with playmakers all over the field like Bedford and Euclid both have. So 8-7, uh, they convert the two-point conversion and uh, take the lead on Copley. And for Bedford, I'm 
I'm already looking ahead a little bit because I want to see what they do. Look at ma- you. I, like, this is not Sean, a game they're going to win. Sean Williams would not like know. that. I don't know if they're going to win this game, but I want to see them go against Maslin next week. <laughs> That's going to be a fun game. Now, obviously, they got to take care of Copley, who's a very good football team. But win or lose, I want to see what they can do against a team like Maslin. That'll be interesting. They, you know, we saw what Menor did against them, so, you know, keep that yeah. in mind. We're going to head back to the phones. We uh, are joined by Ryan Isley. Ryan has the uh, Maslin-Jackson, Maslin-Perry battle. Ryan, what's going on with the uh, Perry and Jackson game? Hey, guys. Hey, guys. So far, it's been Jared Pallotta throwing the ball all over the field. He has just thrown his third touchdown pass for Jackson, and they lead 24-7 to with about eight minutes left here in the second quarter. His third touchdown pass just happened a moment ago. A 61-yard strike to Brandon O'Quinn. It was O'Quinn's second touchdown catch of the day. Uh, Maslin Jackson started this game out 17 to nothing. Perry scores a touchdown, and then Jackson just strikes right back in about three plays. Again, 69 yards from Pilata to O'Quinn for the third touchdown pass of the day for Jarrett Pilata. Uh Ryan, it sounds like Maslin kind of knows what to expect as far as that wing tee from the uh, Perry Panthers goes. I'll tell you what, Jackson's defense has been very uh, very sturdy up front. They haven't blown assignments, which is where you get in trouble when you're playing against the wing tee. If you don't, if you don't hold your assignment, that's how somebody gets wide open and breaks down the field for a 40- or 50-yard run. I've seen Perry do it in, the, in years past. So far tonight, and I know it's still kind of early, but Jackson's defense has been up to the challenge, which is kind of surprising. After uh, talking to some people before this football game, I was told not to expect Jackson's front line to be able to hold up to Perry's front line. But so far, it's been the other way around. All right. We appreciate it, Ryan Isley. Uh, we'll check back in with Ryan as he has that battle between Perry and Jackson. Uh, let's check back in Hudson and Brexville. A Suburban League battle. Hudson took the early lead. And uh, you know what? These Brexville bees. There's the freshman Labus going up top. Wigless grabs it for the touchdown. Those two doing some good things. They missed the point after though. So Hudson uh, still with the lead, seven to six. But the freshman playing like a senior. And, and if you have a freshman quarterback, it's great to have a senior receiver like Wigless, a guy that they. Uh, I don't know if I should say this or not, but they call him Wiggles. Don't, don't <laughs> call him that. Don't tell him I told you to say that. But that's what they call him. Well, uh, he gets free. He wiggles yeah, free. There you go. We'll, we'll turn it into a positive. <laughs> to have a senior receiver like that uh, for a freshman quarterback, and we saw that throw. I mean, a good, good throw. Throwback, good throw. You saw they the might have something cooking yeah, I mean, there. Well, the, the thing is, you saw him stand tall in the pocket and deliver the ball right on the money behind. You know, the Wiggle, Wiggless beat the coverage, mm-hmm. and he put it right on the money. They got a pretty good running back, too, and, and Alex Buckley. So they've got weapons, as they always do at Brexville. Absolutely, and I, I felt like going into this game, you know, it's going to come down to who can make the play in the end because there's going to be a lot of yards, there's going to be a lot of points being put up in this game. Uh, that's my prediction, so we're going to see what happens. Ooh, we're uh, going to hold you to that. Yeah, we're just, we're just going to see what happens. Defensive but. coordinator for Hudson ain't going to be happy about Nate's prediction. But no, but absolutely, and, and bringing that point, I mean, the defense, that's one of my concerns. Uh, you know, just I felt like Hudson was putting up a lot of points, and Camp McKinley, they don't help that case either. All right. But no, they just, I felt like they put up a lot of points, and the, uh, they, they've allowed a lot of points in these first three weeks. And so that was something that they needed to clean up, especially in Brexville's not going to help that case either. Uh, but Labus, over 300 yards passing last week. So, you know, he's very dangerous as a freshman. But take a look. We're going to see what Greg Melly does uh, here on his next turn. All right, let's uh, check back in with one of the featured games that uh, we have been following, the Euclid Panthers taking on the Medina Bees and uh, Medina answering. And a handoff, big hole. And heading into the end zone is Levi Pokersnick. And he is a transfer from Benedictine. Went back to his home school in Medina. Goes into the end zone to cut into that 13-0 Euclid lead. It's now 13-7. So Medina answers. They're a point after and a point, uh, a point after and a touchdown away from taking the lead. So good for the Bees. And they've got to get that offense going. Seven points total in the last two weeks. So to get seven here in the second quarter. And you can't fall behind Euclid. Uh, you, you want to stay close, especially because, as we've talked about, we know Euclid is a not a strong finishing team necessarily. So uh, they'll punch you. 
you got to be able to punch back, and that's a good a good start by Medina. We'll see if they can sustain this, though. And I'm sure it was a great sign to have Medina see a score go in because he was the only one that scored in that 44 to seven loss to Wadsworth last week. Uh, but again, this is a conference game. Uh, these two teams are very familiar with each other. And uh, last week, uh, Medina lost their second running back uh, with injury last week. So uh, this team, this offense, needs to find a way to be able to put some more points on the board against a very uh, talented equity offense. And, and Poker Snick is a guy that plays quarterback. He played quarterback at Benedictine. Uh, they f switched him into the backfield, as you alluded to, when they lost their second running back. Uh, they're trying to get Dylan Fultz back. Uh, he and he's another guy that's big play potential that's been banged up. So, bees are banged up, fighting, uh, just uh, a touchdown and a point after away from taking the lead. So, uh, good things for the, the Medina bees in the early going. Uh, against Euclid. Yeah, they've just got, they've got to figure out how to cover all those weapons. It's easier said than done. Yeah, and absolutely also to lose your quarterback too, Gavin Montgomery. Wow. I mean, you know, this team has got to figure out some answers and also some leadership. Like, who's going to be able to put these points on the board? Who's going to be able to tell us, you know, where do we need to go? So th those guys are going to be looking off on the uh, off sidelines trying to figure out what's going on and what the coaches need to want. So. Well, what we're going to do, we're going to head to the phones. Bryant Kaiser is at the Wadsworth Nordonia game. He joins us on the phone. Bryant, what's going on with the Knights and the Grizzlies? Well, well we're about to have a shootout over here. It's, now it's 21 15, Wadsworth. Um, uh, Nordonia is coming back. Um, good game, so good game, good game. They just had a 45 yard touchdown pass to Dottie Willis down Nordonia. He intercepted a pass. It's like in baseball, you make a great play on defense, you come up the bat and hit a home run. That's what he just did. And it's like 21-15 uh, with 6.51 to go in the second quarter. I hope you have a lot of paper to write down all the scoring that's going on here. Uh, has it seemed I, like, the, has the Knights defense seemed like they might have figured something out there? Or? Yeah, uh, a lot of lot of missed tackles. Uh, the little pass they had for 40, 55 yards. Uh, I think they was in a cover too, and I think the one in defense back for Wildsworth did not know that. So he went um, 40 yards untouched. <laughs> All right, Bryant Kaiser. We will check back in with Bryant. Uh, he will give us updates from the Wadsworth Nordonia game. Good, good for the Knights. Uh, you know they 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 come back and. Cut into that lead, and now it's a six-point game. And, and offense hasn't been a problem for the Knights, really, for the most part. It's been, it's been defense. A couple weeks ago against Woodridge, they actually outgained Woodridge, even though they lost the game. So scoring hasn't been a problem. It's been getting off the field that has been a big problem. Yeah, uh, Bobby Levock, uh, the quarterback, had a, close to 300 passing yards last week. This is a team that we've you know, really felt bad for. We were talking about it early before the show. It's just that they've been putting up so many yards and putting all this effort in. But the, they've been f really up against some monster offenses in the first three weeks. And so uh, to see that they're kind of keeping us close with the Grizzlies right now, a uh, league opponent as well, good sign for them. Yeah, and, and Grizzlies off to a great start. Wadsworth 3-0 and on the year. And obviously, Coach Todd and those guys thinking playoffs. Uh, you know, you get off to that 3-0 and start and, and you start looking at it and it's like, okay, guys, we, you know, we're – We've put ourselves in a position when we enter league play that if we do what we're supposed to do, good things will happen. And Nordonia gets into the grinder after this one. Oh, got yeah. Hudson, Stowe, Brexville, their next three games after this. So the, they've got to figure out a way to get this win against Wadsworth. Or, uh, you know, then you're, then you're just kind of fighting to stay above water. And, I mean, you're winless going into that stretch. Good luck. Okay, we've uh, checked in a couple of times on the Bedford Bearcats and the Copley Indians. And uh, I warned you, lightning strikes. Here it is again. And it's Jenkins to Johnson. 79 yards for the touchdown. Davion Johnson grabs it from Emmanuel Jenkins. Lightning strikes for the third time as Bedford now leading 20 to seven over the Copley Indians. Big plays, the big play Bearcats back at it. All Johnson does is score touchdowns. Uh, three of them last week. Now he's got one there. Uh, man, <laughs> number four knows how to find the end zone. Yeah, I think he has, like, touchdowns in his pocket, and he just, like, <laughs> said, oh, here you go, Bearcats. Here, I got you one. But, yeah, uh, uh, 132 yards receiving last week on nine receptions. 
two touchdowns uh, in the air and then one on the ground as well. So uh, Johnson knows how to find the end zone, and as we were talking about, yeah, it must be in his pocket somewhere. So it sounds like Jenkins knows how to find him too. Yeah, I mean it's. <laughs> It, it does make it a little fun when you've got speed and you can spread guys out, get the ball to your speedy playmakers in space, and then say, okay, try to tackle him. And, and then you go back to week one, Kenneth Wilkins had five scores, including a defensive touchdown. I mean, there are playmakers, kind of like with Euclid, there are playmakers all over the place with Bedford. And in, in the last meeting with Copley, you know, I felt like this was something that, you know, what was getting in the way of Bedford were the turnovers. Uh, you know, they have so many play, guys that can make plays, and obviously, you know, this is probably this is a good sign to see Sean Williams say, like, you know, hey, I, I think we can get it around the field. I think we can move it around as much as we can. Uh, but, yeah, you know, so far I'm sure Coach has got to be pleased right now with this effort. And those turnovers will drive Sean Williams crazy. He's a guy that preaches taking care of the football, like most coaches. We're going to step aside, take a timeout as we head to break. Our band correspondent, Krista Daffini from Independence High School, is with the Nordonia Band. Take it away, Krista. Krista Daffini here at Nordonia High School with the Lancer Marching Band. Brass section is behind me. The, as they warm up, they're in different sections, which is different from last week's band, who did it all together and performed marching as their warm up as well. This band is a competition band. They perform in state competition OMEA and BOA Midwest competitions. They have only scored superior multiple times in the, fifth, in the past 50 years that they've ever performed there. That's pretty impressive. Spectrum. Wednesday nights. Get ready for kickoff with Spectrum Sports. High School Blitz Preview. The can't miss show for all things high school football. 